Hey everybody, it's Mr. Matthew here for Honors Biology video 8-2B. And in this video, we're going to pick up where we left off, where we're talking about how eukaryotes have acquired their metabolic pathways from symbiotic relationships and endosymbiotic relationships. And we're going to take those and we're looking at how protists and fungi play important roles in the ecosystems based off of those acquired metabolic pathways. So let's talk about some of the ecological roles that are involved with being a protist. So the first one we're going to talk about is that as a photosynthesis or as a producer. And so in this particular instance, we're showing a photosynthetic paramecium. And in this case, it's actually showing two different things. One, it's showing that there are photosynthetic protists. There's things like this. There's also euglena and other things that drop into our protista kingdom that are photosynthetic. But in this particular case, paramecia normally are not photosynthetic. But because this is paramecium bursaria, Paramecium bursaria have the capacity of taking in a photosynthetic bacteria and using it very much like a chloroplast. So in this particular case, what we're looking at is a photosynthetic version of a paramecium because of its mutualistic relationship. Our second example that we're going to look at is zooxanthellae and coral animals. In this case, the zooxanthellae is the protist and the animal it's going to form a symbiotic relationship with is a coral. And so we see over here a coral animal with its coral polyps and inside this organism, inside this animal, we will see a little tiny photosynthetic cells. And this is a really cool example in both of these instances of looking at how photosynthetic algae are acting very much like we think the first chloroplasts would have behaved inside those first eukaryotic cells. We have a photosynthetic organism living inside another organism and then developing a mutualistic relationship. So this is a symbiotic relationship where it's taken inside an organism in the same lines as endosymbiosis. Now, when we look at phytoplankton, this is sort of your traditional producer that we look at. But in addition to being a traditional producer, it's also heavily involved with the carbon cycle because it's going to be taking carbon out of the atmosphere and fixing it into carbohydrates. This is how most carbon enters into the food chain is by the photosynthetic action of phytoplankton and other producers. And then a really interesting other ecological role we see with protists is that of an amoeba. And in this, I've got a video of an amoeba that's engulfed a couple of paramecium caudatum. And you can see it engulfing those paramecium caudatum right here. And as it engulfs those paramecium caudatum, it's going to release digestive enzymes and it's going to break those paramecium down and it's going to basically reduce it just to a bunch of macromolecules that it can absorb into its body. So this is a predatory action by a protist. So we have both producer and consumer being shown here and we also see it forming mutualistic relationship in these ecological roles. So another thing to talk about is the concept of how fungi are really different from the other eukaryotic groups. Now, we talked about how protists are not a true clade, but we will see that in terms of the other eukarya, animals, plants, and fungi, these are all distinct kingdoms in which all of the members of the kingdom are going to share specific unique characteristics. Protists don't really have that, but fungi do. And you might be thinking, okay, well, why are we talking about the fungi? Because fungi, because of the way that they grow, are often actually microbial organisms. Most of the action of most fungi is either in a single cell, if we talk about something like a yeast, or is going to be in very fine threads of multicellularity that are not really observable to us. So what I want to do is I want to talk about the different characteristics that we see within the kingdom of fungi. And I'm going to use this diagram over here on the side to highlight some of those characteristics. So one of the key things that we notice is that most of the cells that we see inside of most fungi are haploid. That's not to say that there are not diploid structures within them, but they will mostly be single haploid nuclei inside the cell. So I show up here, these are some red nuclei, over here are some blue nuclei, and occasionally you'll even get two haploid nuclei inside the same cell, like we see down here, and even in those cases, these nuclei are haploid. Haploid is the typical structure of most fungi cells. 
They will occasionally form di diploid structures when they reproduce, but again, not sort of the default characteristic that we look at. Next, we talk about cell walls. Now, all fungi have cell walls, and those cell walls are made up of a specific term called chitin, um, which is C-H-I-T-I-N. Sometimes you'll see it pronounced chitin, but I prefer chitin as the pronunciation. And chitin is a specific type of carbohydrate that is the cell wall makeup only of the fungi. Interestingly enough, chitin is also the stuff that makes up the uh, exoskeletons of uh, lobsters and crayfish and that sort of thing. But from a cell wall structure, if you find an organism that has a cell wall and it's made up of chitin, it's going to fit into the kingdom fungi. We will see that there are cell walls in some other kingdoms, such as plants, and plants have their own individual cell wall structure made of cellulose. Again, protists catch-all category. It's going to be all over the place. Another commonality we see within this kingdom is the concept of absorptive nutrition. And what that means is that in all instances, what we're going to see is the fungi are going to secrete enzymes outside their body. They will digest materials outside their body, and they'll absorb the nutrients that are a breakdown from that. I'll show some specific examples of that when I get into the specific niches that we see of fungi. Another component that we'll also see is the general life cycle of these. So one of the key terms that we talk about when we look at fungi are the concept of hyphae. Hyphae are these thread-like structures that are individual long hairs that are going to be long lines of cells. So that's what a hyphae is. And I, if I was to circle, I could circle right here, and this would be an example of part of a hyphae. So those are the thread-like structures that are going to make up a fungi. Now, when you have a large mass of those in a given area, we refer to that as the mycelia. So mycelia would be all of the hyphae that we find underneath the ground in a particular fungi. So if you come across out in the woods and you find, say, a mushroom, a mushroom is going to be a reproductive structure. And that mushroom will be made up of a series of hyphae. And those hyphae are going to also make up the underground portion of the fungus, which is known as the mycelia. In fact, most of that particular fungus that you're seeing the mushroom, the mushroom is literally just the very top of that organism and is a specific reproductive structure. Now, not every fungi produces a mushroom, but all fungi produce reproductive structures that will end up giving off spores. Uh, going back to this particular diagram, in this particular diagram, we see that the spores are produced and the spores are generated by something that is referred to as an ascospore. And this is just a different phyla, a non-mushroom producing fungus, but they are going to produce spores as their reproductive structures. All right, so that's like a lot of jargon that has to do with fungi, but hopefully it gives you sort of a sense of if you were to get a description of a characteristic of an organism, you would see some of these key characteristics, the type of cell walls, the structure of the hyphae or the mycelia, the type of nuclei, and you'd be able to pull that information and say, yeah, I think those are things that are characteristic of the kingdom of fungi. All right, so let's talk about the niches that you would find that fungi might take over. So one of the most common ones that we talk about all the time is that is of a decomposer. So in this case, we see that there's a dead tree. That dead tree is going to contain all kinds of carbohydrates, such as starches and cellulose. And what we'll find is that around these dead trees, you're going to tend to find lots of fungi come along. Now, again, similar to what we talked about in the previous slide, the underground portion of the fungus that's interacting with those tree roots, that's going to be called a mycelium. And then when this is ready to reproduce, they will put up a reproductive structure, such as a mushroom that's shown right here, that will then spread spores and allow for this to reproduce and create new fungi. Another sort of interesting characteristic we see, and this is not a really common one, but I think it's a, a neat idea, is the idea that you will have predatory fungi. And so there's a small group of fungi that will create these lasso-like hyphae. And again, because of their absorptive nutrition, they have the ability to secrete enzymes out. So if a roundworm, something like a C. elegans, started to swim through that, you would end up having this with lasso around that. And the contact between the enzymes that are secreted outside that hyphae and the roundworm it would end up being able to break down that roundworm and 
digest it and then it would be able to absorb those nutrient nutrients this if this doesn't sound like a horror film to you uh, i don't know how better to describe the horrific idea but imagine somebody throws a lasso around your waist and rather than making you tell the truth it digests your body by secreting enzymes for it, it sounds fairly horrifying to me but that would be what we see in this microscopic world and then the last example I have of a fungi are as parasites. There's lots of examples. Your textbook actually runs through a whole bunch. Uh, I'm using the one that most people know most commonly, which is that of athlete's foot. An athlete's foot is a human disease in which a fungi will grow on your skin and the mycelium will embed inside the outer surface of your skin and it can lead to the digestion of the outer layer of skin and can lead to itching and rash and that sort of thing. There are some much more uh, deadly parasitic fungi that particularly if you're immunocompromised can really wreak havoc with your body and in fact can be deadly but I figured this would be a pretty safe parasitic one especially after I talked about the predatory lasso one I don't want to give anybody nightmares all right, so let's talk about the concept of symbiosis. And in this particular instance, I'm going to focus in on two symbiotic relationships that are really commonly seen within fungi. One of these is that of mycorrhizal fungi. And the mycorrhiza is a type of fungi that is going to form a symbiotic relationship with the roots of trees. And what it's going to do is it's going to help the tree absorb nutrients uh, and water. And in exchange for that, it is going to get sugar from that plant. So this is your classic example of mutualism. Both organisms, both the fungi and the plant, are going to benefit from this relationship. The way the, the tree, even though the tree is giving up sugars, the way it's going to benefit is it's going to massively increase its ability to absorb materials from the soil, namely minerals and also water from that soil, and it's going to give it a much better chance to survival. A lot of trees uh, are known to have very specific mycorrhizal fungi, and those mycorrhizal fungi will have spores available in soils that are coupled with trees. And we actually know that there's some very specific examples of uh, relationships that have to be perfect, and if you were to try to take a plant and grow it in sterile soil, it doesn't grow very well. This is true of orchids, but it's also true of a few different other organisms that they found, that when they took out the seeds and tried to plant them, in a greenhouse that if they didn't take some of the natural soil that contained some of those fungal spores, they just weren't very successful. The other example that I want to talk about is that of lichen. And lichen is this, um, you can see down here, it's sort of that papery looking stuff that grows on the outside of trees. Uh, it usually has a greenish tinge, although it really can vary quite broadly in color. And lichen is really interesting. So what we see is, if I look at this diagram, everything that's in blue re represents the hyphae or the mycelium, depending on which part of it, but definitely hyphae that you see of a fungus. And then the green spheres also represent a different organism, and it's usually a photosynthetic organism. But these are photosynthetic organisms that have developed symbiotic relationship, so much so that we don't actually separate these, and we refer to it as a single species that has cells from different kingdoms mixed together. So what we'll see here is in lichen, when you find a, a lichen specimen, it is always going to have different cells from different kingdoms that have come together so closely that they cannot be separated, and they are classified as a single type of living thing thing, even though there are cells from different kingdoms within that organism. Again, a form of symbiosis that makes our classification hard. And, you know, you could view this as a parallel to some of the things that we saw with endosymbiosis back in video 8-2A. All right, so I hope that you all find this video helpful, and I will talk to everybody soon.